Thanks, uh, everybody, for joining us this morning. Uh, I'll now call this uh, meeting of the Standing Committee of Economic Development and Environment to order. Uh, my name is Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the MLA for uh, Frame Lake, and I've been asked to chair the meeting this morning. Um, and uh, perhaps I'll uh, offer an opening meditation for the meeting this morning. Uh, if you wish to experience peace, provide peace for another. If you wish to know you are safe, cause another to know that they are safe. If you wish to understand seemingly incomprehensible things, help another to understand. If you wish to heal your own sadness or anger, seek to heal the sadness or anger of another. Dalai Lama. So um, the review and adoption of the agenda for today. Um, Madam Clerk, I think we just have the one item, a public or a presentation from um, our uh, colleague from Saskatchewan. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, with Mr. Dustin Smetana from the uh, government of Saskatchewan. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, welcome, uh, Dustin, to our uh, meeting. And uh, we'll just uh, get do a few formalities before we, we uh, call on you. Um, are there any uh, additions or changes to the agenda? Not seeing any. Can I have uh, somebody move adoption of the agenda? Uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you. Uh, any uh, objections to that? Motion's in order. All those in favor? Yay, thank you. Motion is carried to uh, adopt the agenda. So. Um, any declarations of conflict of interest? Not seeing any. Um, so the uh, Legislative Assembly's uh, Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment is part of the uh, Legislative Assembly. Uh, and we, uh, it's uh, the regular uh, MLAs uh, that uh, make up the uh, Standing Committee. So amongst the responsibilities that we have committee, has identified uh, uh, prevention and management of uh, contaminated sites as one of our priorities. And of course, we're also interested in finding out more about the remediation economy and uh, economic benefits uh, that, that can uh, be associated with uh, proper remediation. So we're, we've, uh, this is part of our process of uh, um, giving a better understanding of uh, the issue of contaminated sites is hearing from uh, experts and uh, other jurisdictions as well to better understand challenges and opportunities. Um, so I'm going to ask each of the uh, uh, committee members to uh, introduce themselves and perhaps we'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you're sounding very muffled. Perhaps uh, um, you might move a little closer to the mic or uh, just uh, try again. Okay. I can barely hear you. Um, maybe uh, you might um, log on, log off again, and uh, We'll make sure that uh, Jennifer uh, lets you back in again right away. But I'll also I'll turn to uh, Ms. Nockleby, please go ahead. Thank you, can you hear me? Okay, um, my name is Katrina Nockleby. I'm the MLA for Great Slave, which is a riding in Yellowknife. Um, I actually have a background in contaminated sites myself. I'm a geological engineer. So I used to do a lot of environmental site assessments and drilling and all of those good things, soil and water sampling. So I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from you today. And, and I've worked at Giant Mine too, which is one of the drivers for our um, kind of conversation around uh, remediation economy and such, because obviously we have one of the largest <laughs> contaminated sites in Canada at our doorstep. So I'm very interested to hear what Saskatchewan's been doing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ms. Nockleby. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jackie Jacobson for MLA for for Nanakput, most northerly riding in uh, in our territory, and uh, we are wanting to hear about. Uh, we have a bunch of sump sumps that we need to be cleaned up, so 
looking forward to hearing what you have, and uh, thank you for taking the time for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Jacobson. We're, we're joined by uh, another MLA this morning as well. Uh, Ms. Cleveland, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Caitlin Cleveland. I'm the MLA for Cam Lake, which is also riding in Yellowknife, and I do apologize. I'm going to leave my uh, video off this morning just to share internet with four other video meetings that are happening in this house today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Ms. Cleveland. So uh, just so our guest and those uh, watching in the future know, uh, Ms. Cleveland has a, a number of uh, uh, children at home uh, trying to do um, uh, homeschooling or not homeschooling, but online education, distance education. So it's always a bit of a challenge uh, when that's happening in your household as well. So we, we also have with us this morning our uh, Clerk uh, Jennifer Frankie Smith and uh, our research advisor uh, Amy Lizot uh, as well. So um, I'm going to ask though that uh, everyone direct any comments and questions, remarks to myself as chair and uh, please wait to be recognized before speaking. Uh, this will just help ensure that we have a, a smooth uh, meeting this morning. Um, and uh, I guess now I'd like to uh, introduced uh, Mr. Dustin Smet Smetana, I hope I get the, the name right, with the government of Saskatchewan. Uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself and any staff that you have uh, with you today. And then you, of course, you can proceed into your uh, uh, presentation. We do have your PowerPoint slides and our staff are going to uh, endeavor to get them up on the screen as well as you go through the, the presentation. So uh, if you need the slides changed, if you could just indicate that and then uh, Jennifer will uh, help uh, make that happen. But uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself. And uh, thanks very much for, for joining us from uh, probably Regina this morning. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and standing committee members for inviting and allowing myself to present on behalf of the government of Saskatchewan and, and our administration of the institutional control program. <clears throat> Yeah, my name is Dustin Smetana. I'm a senior analyst with uh, the Mineral Policy Division um, with the Ministry of Energy and Resources. And I just, I just wanted to kind of maybe um, start the presentation off and, and demonstrate um, that the Ministry of Energy and Resources administers the program. And we have a Ministry of Environment, which is our compliance and environmental regulators, which, which largely deal with uh, on-site uh, and com compliance of uh, reclamation and decommissioning. And, and I work jointly with that ministry to assure that uh, these properties enter the institutional control program. And, and where the institutional control program uh, lies or fits in the life cycle, I'll go through this later, but just, just for, for an understanding, uh, before we get into the presentation, it is not an kind of active uh, part of remediation. It is the post remediation and, and the monitoring and the maintenance of those sites into long term or perpetuity and to providing kind of a funding mechanism, uh, you know, so we can have some type of as, as you guys are looking for a little bit of an economic opportunity to to monitor those sites. <clears throat> Again, so thank you for having me today and um, as far as questions go, um, we could, uh, I mean, if you, if, as Mr. Chair indicated, if you could just direct questions to him, it might be better to maybe make a note in the slide and, and we could revisit the slides after the presentation and, and might facilitate some, some discussions post presentation. Okay, so if we could get the slide show up. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I think we'll hold all the questions until the end and then uh, we can do that. So yeah, please go sure. ahead. Okay. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a, a, a former open pit uranium mine uh, near Uranium City, Saskatchewan. And so Saskatchewan's institutional control program throughout the presentation, I will interchangeably use its acronym, which is ICP or institutional control or the program, uh, just for reference. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is institutional control and what is the, the program? So institutional control, by an internationally accepted definition, are actions or mechanisms or arrangements that are implemented 
in order to maintain control or knowledge of a waste management site. It's a formal regulatory process that allows a company of a closed industrial site on Crown land to transfer the site responsibility back to the province of Saskatchewan when the mining and milling activities have ended. Um, Government of Saskatchewan's um, successful administration of the Institutional Control Program has been recognized both nationally and internationally, and it promotes sustainable mining in Saskatchewan. Next slide, please. So who benefits from ICP? So first, the local area residents benefit because it instills confidence on proper closure methods and allows opportunities to regain access to the reclaimed areas. It ensures long-term monitoring maintenance uh, of the sites by placing associated costs on the mining companies, which instills confidence in the public. Mining companies, it relieves prior agreed upon environmental or financial commitments, and it achieves an operational endpoint that helps facilitate new business decisions. And for the provincial regulators, it establishes benchmarks and measures to perform um, site objectives against. Next slide, please. So why do we need it? So many of Saskatchewan's mine and mills are on Crown land, which is land leased by the province to the mining companies. And, and mines have a finite lifespan. And institutional control helps define the life cycle of a mining operation. And it reassures that we do not duplicate past practices and improves on our regulatory processes. Next slide, please. Okay, so I would like to go through some of the some of the processes of the program. What you're seeing here is uh, overlooking uh, the Beaver Lodge Lake in Saskatchewan, which is from the former El Dorado uranium mining and milling operation. Next slide, please. Okay, so the life cycle of a mine. It begins with early exploration uh, through construction and operation. And after operation into decommissioning and monitoring. And after monitoring in Saskatchewan, the provincial regulators will release that lease from holding a, a permit if it is to go into institutional control program. And you can see where institutional control program sits at the end of the life cycle of a mine. And today's mines operations consider and incorporate institutional control during feasibility studies and operational planning. Next slide, please. So the Institutional Control Program is legislated in accordance with the Reclaimed Industrial Sites Act and the Reclaimed Industrial Sites Regulations. And its purpose is to support safe, environmentally sound decommissioning of industrial sites. It ensures ongoing monitoring and maintenance of these sites continue. It provides funds to cover the costs associated with the long-term monitoring maintenance of those sites. And it ensures that records and information of the sites are preserved through the establishment of the Institutional Control Registry. Next slide, please. So the program confirms the protection of human and health safety, its care for the environment, ensures future generations are not burdened with long-term costs of the monitoring maintenance, and it recognizes all jurisdictional regulatory obligations. So the two main components of the program are the funds and the registry. Okay, next slide, please. So as I indicated earlier that the Institutional Control Program is governed by legislation, um, which means the funds are outside of the Provincial General Revenue Fund and are not able to be absorbed into provincial budgets. So proponents or companies contribute uh, the funds based on the site responsibility. So each site undergoes a risk assessment and is forecasted by present day costs to monitor and maintain the site. The financial model is projected on a net present value figure over a hundred year term where funds are expected to achieve a return base. 
We have one fund for the monitoring maintenance costs, and we have one fund for the unforeseen funds. Sorry, unforeseen events fund. <clears throat> the monitoring maintenance are the expected or known costs. And the unforeseen fund is a contingency that is applied to each site in its specifics with respects to um, um, the site features, such as if the site contains tailings or engineered structure, an engineered structure such as a, a mine closure or a concrete or stainless steel cap. Uh, with more site risk, more, more contingency is applied. And an unforeseen is typically associated with a climate related event such as flooding or drought. And the funds are uh, advised by a committee which is comprised of senior government representatives and stakeholders and invested. The next slide, please. So the institutional control registry is a formal site record is a formal site record where a data repository accounts for all historic and current information as it relates to the accepted site. Such examples are the institutional control registry number, relevant dates of closures or acceptance, um, defining the site boundaries, uh, past owner or operators on the site, prior operating permits or licenses, uh, op operational documentation such as mine uh, drawings, uh, and of course the monitoring and maintenance plans, uh, closure and inspection reports are all recorded and, and information is, is archived. And the registry is also available for public access. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this slide is trying to demonstrate kind of a sequential order of, of what it would look like, like for a site to be uh, accepted into the program. So of course we start with the application from the company or the opponent to, to, um, to have their site accepted into the, into the program. They would then submit a, um, a monitoring and maintenance plan that's satisfactory and it's satisfied and, and able to satisfy all financial assurances such as um, putting up money for a, a, a maximum failure event, which um, a maximum failure event could be something like a collapsed crown pinner, pillar, sorry. Uh, or, or a replacement of a mine cap opening. They would then uh, be issued from the province of uh, Saskatchewan, uh, a release from decommissioning and the reclamation requirements. And, and the same, same Ministry of Environment would issue the surrender of their surface lease. And the, and the surface lease would then be made into uh, the Ministry of uh, Energy and Resources. Uh, in the case of a nuclear waste management site, um, they would, the proponent would need a license exemption from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. The Ministry of Energy and Resources uh, puts administrative controls um, around the area that is accepted and, and be able to monitor any future land use. And once all the monies have been agreed upon and, and the activities have been approved um, and in con collaboration with the, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, if need be, and the provincial regulators, the, it is a formally accepted site into the, to the registry or to the program. Next slide, please. So some of the administration or management of the program, that is um, to publish annual reports describing the business of the funds, along with financial statements on a yearly basis is to prepare an institutional control report every five years that is laid before the Legislative Assembly, um, to review the program legislation every five years and, and making sure that uh, the legislation is addressing current, current needs, to administer the monitor and maintenance schedule and report the inspection outcomes. Inspections typically include such things as surface water sampling, visual uh, inspections for human activities, topographical changes and maintenance of the mine closures or any signs related um, on sites. And to publish and update the registry report as new sites enter the institutional control program. Next slide, please. So in summary, the program is administered by the Ministry of Energy and Resources. Uh, it accept, currently accepts mining and milling sites that are located on Crown lands once activities have ended. It ensures the sites are monitored and maintained into the future. 
It allows opportunity to regain access to the formal industrial sites, and it establishes an endpoint for mining companies. It improves regulatory processes and learns from historical practices. Next slide, please. So the current uptake of the program is we have 24 Beaver Lodge area uranium mine sites, one former gold operation site, and one former silica sand operation site. And what, what the pictures demonstrate in the, in the bottom left is a, a mine shaft closure near Uranium City that is previously decommissioned with a concrete cap. But best practices for closure methods have started to use stainless steel, and you can see the transition into the stainless steel cap. Uh, the, the, on the right side, the pictures indicate um, a former gold mine operation during um, post-closure, intermediation, and, and after into reclamation and monitoring. Next slide, please. So all public information or all public facing information, such as uh, legislation, the registry, fund reports, discussion papers, site closures or inspection reports can be available on saskatchewan.ca. Or if interested in further detail, you can email myself, um, Dustin uh, Smetana at government or gov.sk.ca. Um, and at this point, I'd like to, to conclude uh, a brief presentation uh, of the Institutional Control Program and uh, and, 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 um, and allow for any questions or discussions, uh, I'd be happy to answer anything. Hey, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Smetana. Um, really appreciate the chance to uh, chat with you. Um, what I'll do committee is uh, we'll open it up and uh, allow each uh, committee member a couple of questions and then uh, I'll get a list going and then we can go through a second, third round if, if uh, we don't want to hold you all day uh, as well, but uh, um, I think we'll, we'll proceed in that manner. So uh, I see uh, Ms. Nockleby has her hand up, so why don't you get started? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I apologize. I did step away for a second. So if you did mention the answer to my question, I, I do apologize. Uh, you might have seen me smile a bit there when you mentioned Beaver Lodge. I actually did some tailings cover work at Beaver Lodge when I was first up in the north. Uh, so familiar with the area and was sort of excited to see Uranium City being mentioned. Um, my question is around, uh, does the legislation have any sort of, uh, like up here in the north, we have a lot of involvement with our Indigenous organizations and governments and, um, you know, have a lot of conversation around the involvement of them in remedial work and monitoring and sort of the land guardians program. Does your, your program or legislation have any of that kind of built into it? Or is that sort of separate from this registry and funds uh, system? Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Nalkeby, uh, Mr. Smetana. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, to, to completely understand the question. Does the legislation incorporate um, kind of uh, consultations with some of the local communities or, or custodian, sorry, could you? Yeah, sorry, uh, and I think it's probably coming from a different bit of context. I, I guess around actually having, getting the work themselves and creating sort of uh, almost business opportunities, but yet, you know, then, and, and consultation obviously is a part of that, but uh, I'm just curious to see maybe how the, how Saskatchewan is incorporating the Indigenous and traditional knowledge into this program. Thank you. Okay, for sure, yes. Um, so uh, to answer the question specifically, nothing in legislation um, indicates whether or not uh, uh, the inspections or any of the remediation work needs to be done by the communities. It is a government of Saskatchewan policy to uh, when we procure this work, obviously we we tender it out for the public and, and qualified persons. Um, we do uh, encourage uh, companies that are awarded this work to to contact the local communities for for exactly what you said for site expertise and understanding the areas, and and that is a policy that that I direct when when we do and conduct some of this work. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Smetana. Uh, Ms. Nockleby, uh, go ahead. Yeah, 
Thank you for that. Um, is that actually like, is it a requirement or is there some sort of a, a system built in where there would be like a points awarded for larger Indigenous involvement or local involvement? We have a system like where we generally have a portion of the RFP that's on community engagement. And to me, it's not strong enough. Oftentimes it's kind of a lip service type situation. So I'm just curious to know if Saskatchewan has sort of a similar uh, issue. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Nockleby, uh, Mr. Smetana. Uh, um, so with respect to the, to the, to the work uh, directly related to the program, we don't have anything um, in place uh, or, or written on other than a, than a, than a, than a kind of a, a, a policy that, that we establish. I mean, that's something that we can, we can definitely, we definitely have considered uh, moving forward. Um, and, and thank you for, for bringing that to, to light. Okay, oh, thanks for that, uh, Mr. Smetana. Um, I'm gonna turn to uh, Mr. Johnson, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Smetana for presenting today. Um, I, I was hoping you could give me a sense of whether there is another kind of way <clears throat> of resolving the you know, responsibility operating in conjunction right now in Saskatchewan, or perhaps even some context of what was being done previously. You know, for example, in the Northwest Territories, you, if you have a lease and you've met all the terms of your water license and you've remediated, we, we usually, you know, don't renew the lease and then any kind of continuing monitoring kind of falls back on the government and that's the way it was done in a lot of places. But I guess I'm just surprised that the kind of lack of sites I saw that have actually gone through this. Is there another option if I've, you know, I've concluded my mine, I've remediated it to kind of resolving my liability as a mine operator? Or does the legislation say this program is now the only way to fully walk away? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, so I understand it's voluntary program, but I'll let uh, Mr. Smetana uh, answer as well. Yeah, you bet, uh, Mr. Chair, it is a voluntary program. Um, now I can speak, I don't want to speak as an expert because uh, the, the Ministry of Environment is our provincial regulators that deal with, uh, with financial assurances and, and the decommissioning of mining companies. But I can speak that the legislation for the Reclaimed Industrial Sites Act, uh, uh, I believe was developed with, with the uh, account for um, accepting a site once it receives that release. Um, and to my knowledge that a mining company would not be able to surrender their surface lease uh, without this uh, approval from, from the government, from the Ministry of Ener um, Environment. Uh, and if, if that's the case, then that land um, would, uh, their financial assurance would be reduced based on uh, the amount of, uh, I guess, site impact left at the end of operation. What would be up to the company uh, from my understanding, it would be up to the company to maintain that lease and maintain the monitoring and maintenance activities and the water sampling or whatever needs to, to satisfy the provincial regulators into, into perpetuity. So, so yeah, to answer the question, I, I don't believe that a, a mining company in Saskatchewan can, want, once an operation, can just uh, kind of um, be, remediate the site and then walk away. Without, without entrance into the program. And that, that's why the program was uh, developed. Thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, Smetana. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is the voluntary aspect would really be if, if you have monitoring and you know it's going to be in perpetuity, you, you crunch the numbers to see whether this gives you that kind of peace of mind. Can, I, can you explain a little bit more the extent that you know the mine operator uh, once they're accepted into the program, once all the funds are sorted, uh, has any responsibility? Like say if one of the, a flood occurs and you know you have to dip into the reserve fund and it's millions of dollars, do, is, is there a way that they do become liable again? Um, or, 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 or if that's occurring, is the program simply just, they're responsible for remediation at that point and the, the mine industry you know, can essentially not have to be involved at all. I'm just trying to get the sense of kind of finality once you are in the program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, I think there's some discussion of that in the in the discussion paper itself that's on the website, but uh, Mr. Smetana, go ahead. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> the, as you termed it, the finality of a mining company or operation, that is what the program is deemed uh, necessary. It establishes that endpoint. I mean, it, uh, we do apply contingencies for unforeseen events and, and obviously with climate change being kind of front, um, we're hopeful not to, to use that reserve. I, I believe that they're uh, under one of our um, Environmental Management and Protection Act um, legislations that there is a, an assurance that if, if we need to um, ask this company because of some serious event that, that there's an op opportunity that the company could provide more funding. Um, but the, the program is de designed so that the company can kind of end its operation, essentially excuse themselves of the liability and be able to, um, you know, use their, their mother money or, or, or have a, a new decision on a new business plan and kind of get, the, get this liability off their books. Thanks, uh, Mr. Smetana. Um, uh, Ms. Cleveland, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, my my question, and I, I thank uh, Emily Knockleby for asking the one about um, it, Indigenous involvement and procurement there. Um, my question is in relation to um, trades and training and the relationship between um, you know, the, the remediation piece as far as a, a policy and any kind of like um, market labor development and workforce development happening in Saskatchewan. And if there is a relationship that is seen between kind of the, the direction of that policy and the remediation work and also the development of having your own reclamation um, industry within Saskatchewan and what role the government plays within that. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Cleveland. Uh, Mr. Smetana? Yeah, um, as far as kind of trades and training of, of Indigenous and local communities, um, the program itself doesn't facilitate any, anything of that nature. Um, some, some companies, such as Cameco, that is, is the active remediate, um, the remediation manager of, uh, of the Beaver Lodge properties. Uh, they do, Chemical, I believe, has, has some, some type of uh, Indigenous involvement or, or, or metrics that, that speak to that. As far as the program, um, you know, the, pro the, program, the program doesn't uh, specifically contemplate um, remediation and, and, and procuring remediation and, and doing the remediation. It supports remediation. Uh, the program is is after remediation and monitoring, and and the, the site and the land has has kind of um, been remediated and and following predicted modeling um, of site features. Um, if it's more specific to kind of remediation, um, would would probably better be asked by uh, or answered by the Ministry of Environment and our provincial regulators. Um, I think a, a reoccurring question that that you guys might have and and might be probably better directed at, at Ministry of uh, Environment is, is how to deal with kind of orphan and abandoned sites, uh, how to obtain funding for those sites. Um, and that's something that uh, our, I know that uh, our provincial regulators are dealing with uh, and, and establishing um, through their budgetary documents uh, in order to, 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 to gain that liability in order to, to do some of that work. Because I mean, orphan and abandoned sites are are, are quite large. Thanks, uh, Mr. Smetana. Uh, Ms. Cleveland? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. No, and I appreciate uh, um, the clarification there on what uh, minister would, would be better positioned to answer that. So I guess my next question is, the federal government seems to be doing a lot of funding as far as guardianship programs um, across Canada for um, remediation projects. And, and I'm wondering if Saskatchewan has tapped into that as far as um, ongoing reclamation of sites or ongoing monitoring of sites and how that's worked for them. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Ms. Cleveland, uh, Mr. Smetana. Yeah, we've been looking at what the federal government has been providing for some of these orphan and abandoned sites, and 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 I think the Ministry of Environment has been looking into to achieve some of this funding. Um, I think there's some strict criteria, um, and 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 I, I am aware that what the federal government has offered uh, 
and I and such as like uh, I believe Giant Mine was awarded a bunch of money in a group of other mining remediation programs. But at this current time, uh, to, you know Saskatchewan is still exploring uh, some of these funding opportunities. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Smetana. Um, is uh, Mr. Jacobson still on the line? Um, Jennifer, do you know? Uh, Jackie, are you still there? Do you have any questions? Um, he is not on. He had to, he was losing cell service. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, I'm going to squeeze in a couple of questions if I can. Uh, um, thanks to the committee for their indulgence. Um, I did look at a lot of the materials on the, the website, I scanned them pretty quickly. And I've had, this is probably I think the third time I've had uh, contact with you folks from uh, the Inter Institutional Control Program. Um, over a number of years, I had some involvement with uh, NOAMI in the past and so on. So um, I just want to confirm, I think the latest annual report on the funds that the maintenance and monitoring fund is about $427,000. Was that right? And then the uh, uh, unforeseen events fund is about $64,000. And I guess you have um, about 25, maybe 26 sites in the program. Is, is that is that right? So I, I understand it's still kind of growing in its infancy. Just want to confirm that. Yeah, yeah, you are correct. And, and that is, I guess, when we talk about one of the challenges of the program, that is one of the challenges that um, the first site was accepted in 2009. And um, because of the long um, time frame for decommissioning, reclamation, monitoring, and transition phase monitoring, um, what we see is a large gap in time. And so funds could are sporadic. Now, what we're seeing is the Beaver Lodge properties near completion, which is a near 70 sites. Um, we're, we're seeing some other kind of satellite areas coming into the program as well. And, and so um, what we're going to see is an influx of a, of a large amount of uh, money into the program very soon. Um, and um, I, again, that, that is one of the challenges is, is how many sites does, does a jurisdiction have available and what do they see? Um, the next big site that is anticipated to enter the or Clough Lake uh, mine site to a large number that's been uh, in the mid 2000s so that can give you some better terms into to where the provincial um, regulators are satisfied with the predicted uh, internal modeling and and safe secure and stable or improving um, environmental parameters in order for for a provincial release the covid numbers in saskatchewan you guys are experienced quite the quite the outbreak Saskatchewan's not too far behind, unfortunately. Great right to hear that. <laughs> yeah, we, we were lucky in the first few waves, but we just this one's hitting us hard. Sorry, uh, colleagues, I just got kicked out and <laughs> uh, rejoined. I think I got uh, most of what uh, Mr. Smetana said. About, I think you were starting to slow down and you were talking about Clough Lake and some more sites coming in and that uh, there'd be additional funds. I'd don't know if there's anything beyond that, but I um, I do have a second question if I if I can uh, go ahead and um, look. I, I've always talked about uh, the institutional control program. I think is conceptually it's very good. I think we would probably have to make some major tweaks to it uh, uh, for the Northwest Territories. We have uh, co-management systems here where. Um, much of our uh, resource management is done uh, through. Uh, uh, institutions of public government, but their co-management where they're half the uh, board members are appointed by governments, public governments, the other half are appointed or recommended by uh, Indigenous governments. And uh, we have uh, pretty um, transparent and open um, processes for reviewing applications and so on. Um, but I, I know that uh, Ms. Knockleby had raised the issue of Indigenous involvement in uh, 
sort of your in institutional control program uh, and public involvement, I guess, as well. And uh, can you tell me, say, that the submissions that are made, applications to get into the program, are those documents like posted to a web page or is there the availability for the public to review comment on them? Is there a, a public hearing process attached to that in any way? Uh, that's the kind of system that, that we come from and that we're used to. And maybe that's not the way things are done in, in Saskatchewan, but that's how we do stuff up our way. But what sort of public engagement and involvement uh, is there with the submission uh, 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 submission uh, to submissions to get into the program, and then uh, I know you have a, a registry, and I can see some of the most of that documentation on the website. But what kind of public engagement is there around the submissions themselves? And thanks. Yeah, absolutely, I can speak to that. So, so the application is nothing, um, nothing too in detail, other than than a company or proponent written in submission that is looking to to apply to the program and, and have these certain sites listed sites enter into the program as far as uh, indigenous indigenous or community engagement uh, throughout the years uh, local communities that are impacted by the remediated sites or lands are brought into yearly uh, meetings annual meetings or town halls uh, site visits and that that is done on on um, the recommendation from our well, provincial regulators or federal regulators in order to satisfy um, the regulatory needs. Um, so engagement is done at an early stage and, and throughout this, um, you know, these communities are, are given the opportunity to speak or visit the sites, see how they're being remediated and, and understand what the institutional control is, kind of the end state and, and, and if there's any concerns with with that, at some of these uh, meetings or engagement, um, uh, there's an opportunity where uh, it is made aware that there will be inspections going forward, and that if any uh, local communities or local members have the expertise or ability, that these um, these activities are procured through a, a public RFPs process, and that they have the opportunity to to bid on these as well. Um, so so I, I think more of the regulatory requirements is what, what constitutes the engagement um, more than, than the application to the site. The province, from my understanding, the province would not release, um, it would be a condition of their release that these, these engagements uh, have happened and, and are aware of. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Ms. Nalkopi, I think you have your hand up for second round. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also worked at Clough Lake, so <laughs> didn't realize how much work I had done in Saskatchewan when I first got up north. So a little bit of a tie there to what you're speaking to. Um, my question, you, I, I now kind of understand better when you mentioned like how it works with you looking towards the next one that would be coming and then they're putting up the securities and such. And I do appreciate that maybe we don't understand which departments necessarily of your government. We've got you here, so we kind of pepper you with whatever we can ask. Um, but my question is around sort of like the marketing and promotion of this program. So um, do you find that you're relying sort of on a word of mouth between industry partner or groups or colleagues, or are, is there an active um, campaign or, um, you know, uh, an opportunity, I guess we're not really doing conferences anymore. So it's not like you could set up at a trade show and, and say, hey, this is our great program and all these mining companies might look into it. So I guess the question is like, how do you get this out to, to companies that this is uh, available to them? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Nalkelby, uh, Mr. Smetana. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so so I've, I've been in this position for, for roughly three years and, and the program has been kind of was introduced and, and legislated since uh, 2007. So it's my understanding that my predecessor um, would, would actually uh, present uh, in Australia or, or all over the world. And Saskatchewan was known for kind of uh, internationally first having, having this program. And, and the program, uh, again, from my understanding, it, it took a lot of um, senior officials to sit in rooms and, and to make sure that we developed proper legislation. 
And I, in Canada, I, I, I'm, I've done some research and I think there might be, I've had calls with Newfoundland and Ontario. And um, the problem is, is, is kind of a question that Mr. Johnson had indicated before about, you know, what are our, our, our opportunities for release a company from their, from their permits or from their leases where this legislation specifically speaks uh, to our provincial regulators to issue that certificate or that permit with the intention that it's going to go into the program. So a lot of jurisdictions don't have that opportunity and don't have the legislation set up that allows that. And so that's where the proponent or company is basically on the hook for uh, perpetuity for the monitoring maintenance. Sure, the environmental regulators will reduce their um, financial securities or, or assurances because there's less risk on the site, but they will still have to, to submit samples and, and, and renew permits and, and licenses to satisfy the provincial regulators. So uh, circling back to the questions about promotion, I, I just, I believe that, uh, yeah, it's through word of wealth. Um, we're, we're quite aware of the intact. We have a Saskatchewan Mining Association uh, that I'm sure you're aware uh, that reaches out to its members of all the, uh, the mining industry. And, and we promote this internally. Uh, and, and as well, we see jurisdictional, provincial, uh, sorry, uh, national and, and international attention as well. Hey, thanks uh, for that, uh, Ms. Nockleby. Yeah, uh, I just want to say thank you. I think that sounds like a really great program and, uh, you know, something that uh, is informational to us. And maybe we've helped you guys think a little more around the Indigenous piece that we always uh, deal with. And probably Saskatchewan is maybe a little bit behind uh, somewhat in, in that kind of uh, area. So I just want to say thanks. More of a comment. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think that's more of a comment. Um, Mr. Johnson, any, anything uh, further from you? No, Mr. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Ms. Cleveland? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I have no additional questions. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I've got uh, maybe one or two more if, if I could. Um, so I, I reviewed, I looked through the, the discussion paper rather quickly this morning over breakfast and uh, it looked to me like, um, as I see it or understand it, there's the, the two funds, one for the regular monitoring and maintenance of sites that enter into the program. And then there's the unforeseen events fund and uh, it's calculated at 10% uh, of the value of the uh, 100 year forecast for monitoring maintenance if there's sites without tailings, ponds and without engineered structures. And then 20% if, if those things are present at a site. But it looked like there was still um, financial assurance that operators had to put up as well. And um, can you just confirm that? And let me know what the relationship is between the financial assurance uh, in particular and the unforeseen events fund and how the, the financial assurance is calculated. And if, even if that's not something you do, uh, if you can tell me who does that within your government and, and how they generally look at that, it would be helpful for us to understand. Thanks. Yeah, you're 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 absolutely correct. Um, so the reason the reason that we are uh, we ask for a financial assurance and and it's in the maximum failure event. So when we look at the site, as I indicated before, a maximum failure event could be a replacement of a of a concrete cap or, or stainless steel cap, or a collapsed crown pillar or uh, something that floods out. I mean, those are unforeseen events. But in in since since the program is still considered in its infancy, even though it's been uh, you know, 12 years uh, since we've accepted a site, infancy in relation to the amount of sites and the amount of money in the accounts, we, we require a financial assurance for that, for that cost until the unforeseen events fund becomes um, substantive enough to fund uh, that type of an activity that would occur. Once, once the, the funds have achieved that status, then, then financial assurances for those maximum failure events would not be warranted. Yeah, no, okay, that's uh, helpful for me to understand. Um, 
Yeah, the um, I'll, I'll just say uh, we deal the the Inuvia with final agreement is probably the best one that we have up here in terms of dealing with uh, um, what are called worst case scenarios, whereby um, once uh, if there's an industrial operator that comes into the Inuvia with settlement region. Um, they have to prepare a, um, a worst case scenario analysis and they have to put up financial security in relation to the worst case scenario outcome. And it sounds like that's what you guys do with your um, financial assurance, even though there's still uh, contributions made to the, the monitoring and maintenance fund and then the um, uh, unforeseen events fund. Am I... I see you nodding your head. Just want to uh, confirm that that's kind of the approach that that you guys are taking. Yes, that, that is exactly the approach that we're taking. I mean, it's very unlikely that you have to realize on the financial security or or assurance, whatever you call, but but they are they are put up in order for 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 limiting risk that the government of Saskatchewan is taking. I mean, there, there is risk with the program as with anything that we, we do and operate, but the diligence, the Saskatchewan is under a lot of diligence in, in order to, to reassure that, you know, past practices or legacy sites are, aren't duplicated. Yeah, okay, no, that, that's helpful. Uh, my last one is, uh, you did mention that you expect that at some point the unforeseen events fund is gonna grow large enough that, um, operators might not have to post a full financial assurance for a worst case scenario that, or there might be some other way of, I don't know, is that something that's likely to happen in say the next five, 10 years, or um, at what point does it become large enough? And then how would, uh, uh, would contributions to the unforeseen event fund uh, be rejigged in some way to better recognize worst case scenarios, that, that kind of uh, stuff? Thanks. Sure. Uh, I mean, the program was des designed and intended that at some point, um, the financial assurance would not have to be put up. Um, that doesn't mean, uh, it isn't necessary to say that it could be in five or 10 years. I mean, with the costs and, and, and whatever's happening in today's today's remediation practices or, or climates, uh, it, it's unknown at this time, but that is the intent. Um, the, the contributions to the unforeseen events fund would still can remain. Um, they would just be the financial assurance that we would address. Okay, thanks uh, for that. Uh, any uh, other questions from my colleagues here? Uh, Okay, not seeing any. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you again, Mr. Smetana, for uh, sharing uh, the uh, insights into the institutional control program. Personally, I think it's a very interesting concept, something that we really haven't really dealt with here. Um, the notion of perpetual care plans and so on are just starting to be discussed in the in the context of giant mine, which is now, of course, a public liability. But uh, I think your program offers some interesting insights and uh, opportunities. So thanks very much for uh, presenting to us this morning. And um, uh, I'd like to ask my uh, colleagues to to stay on the line, and we'll do a, a quick. Uh, wrap up. But again, thanks very much for sharing the information uh, with us this morning. And if any closing remarks, uh, happy to hear those. Thanks. No, I, I just encourage anybody who would like to reach out to further discuss any uh, anything related to the institutional control, or if there's any direct concerns with remediation work, um, you know, I could point you in the right direction as Saskatchewan has a robust uh, regulatory um, review process and, and undertaking that uh, that is one that kind of uh, piggybacks off this program and, and basically is is the driving force that allows for this program to achieve to achieve what it has. Um, so I'd be happy to facilitate future discussions uh, with any any one of you and, and again thanks uh, for allowing me to promote this is government of Saskatchewan's institutional control program. Yeah, no, thanks uh, very much. Uh
I push committee to invite to you folks to come and uh, present to us. So as I said, I've heard a, a couple of times over the last maybe eight or 10 years from folks from the program. So I think it's conceptually a, 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 a good thing to do and uh, appreciate your, your time and effort. And um, I'm sure we'll probably mull over what kind of recommendations we wanna make moving forward to our own government in terms of uh, institutional control pro programs or taking care of uh, post-closure uh, liability responsibilities and so on. So thanks again. So um, yeah, we'll say goodbye to you, uh, right. Dustin. Thanks again. Right. And uh, we'll, uh, I'll ask my colleagues to stay on the line so we can do a wrap up. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye folks. Thanks, uh, Jennifer. So uh...